Well, let's take our chorus books and turn to that hymn that we've just heard played, page 8. This is song number 1 in the song section of our chorus book, Complete in Thee, No Work of Mine. Complete in thee, no work of mine may take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and I am now complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought and sanctified salvation wrought thy blood hath pardoned bought for me and glorified i too shall be complete in thee no more shall sin thy grace hath conquered reign within Thy voice shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified, salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be complete in thee each want supplied and no good thing to me denied since thou my portion Lord will be I ask no more complete in thee Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are among thy chosen may i be at thy right hand complete in thee yea justified O oh, blessed thought and sanctified salvation wrought Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Amen. Bob's going to come and read for us. Psalm 84, to the chief musician upon Githeth, a psalm for the sons of Koran. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she can lay her young, even thine altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will, will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are always of them, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our God, our shield, Look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had b rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness.
for the Lord God is a sun as a sun and shield the Lord will give grace and glory no good thing will be withheld from them that walk uprightly O Lord of hosts blessed is the man that trusteth in thee may we pray gracious Heavenly Father we thank you for this opportunity to read your word dear Lord and see Christ we pray that you would open our eyes to see Christ in these very words for he is our righteousness and our grace and our mercy, dear Lord. Be with Ken as he brings forth the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, we'll sing this hymn to the tune of Majestic Sweetness Sits Enthroned. Grace, enough for me, is the theme here. In looking through my tears one day, I saw Mount Calvary Beneath the cross there flowed a stream Of grace enough for me Of grace enough for me While standing there my trembling heart once full of agony could scarce believe the sight i saw of grace enough for me of grace enough for me when i beheld my every sin Nailed to the cruel tree, I felt a flood go through my soul of grace enough for me, of grace enough for me. When I am safe within the veil, my portion there will be to sing throughout the endless day of grace enough for me of grace enough for me sweet testimony there robert's going to come and read for us good morning revelation 14 the reading of the Lord's word. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear not, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of their fortification. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night nor who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you now, and we ask you to give us eyes to see that Christ is still over his sheep. Give us the heart to love Christ and his word. Lord, even though the world still lies in wickedness, we have to realize that Christ is still on his throne. He ordains all things to his glory. Let us look to him today. Be with Brother Ken as he delivers the word. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 215. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption, nor riches of earth could have saved my poor soul. The blood of the cross is my only foundation, the death of my Savior now maketh me whole. I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. But with the price, the blood of Jesus, precious price of love untold. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption. The guilt on my conscience forbade me draw near. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. The death of my Savior could only redeem. I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Bought with a price, the blood of Jesus, precious price of love untold. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption. The holy commandment forbade me draw near. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. The death of my Savior removeth my fear. I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought but not with gold. Bought with a price, the blood of Jesus, precious price of love untold. Nor silver nor gold <clears throat> hath obtained my redemption. The way into heaven could not thus be bought. The blood of the cross is my only foundation death of my savior redemption hath wrought i am redeemed 
but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Bought with the price, <coughs> the precious price of love untold. Amen. David's coming to read for us. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the visible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, even the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. While the idolatry leads men to all manner of lust in their hearts and in their minds, because of the pride of man, he cannot know the truth of God without the Spirit. Only those washed in Christ's blood can see the truth. Be with Ken as he preaches your word. Amen. Well, I've entitled this message, The Wrath of God Revealed. This is not something that man in his natural mind even wants to consider what it is to be under the wrath of God and yet it's vital for us to understand just how holy God is when we talk about God judging sinners there are some that decry that teaching to think well how could God create people and then send them to hell well he's a holy God and he's a just God and his wrath is revealed in many ways Certainly in his word, you can't read his word without seeing a portrayal all the way from the beginning of time to the end of his wrath. I know there's some that say, well, we live in a different era right now because that was before. Now that Christ has come, God's a God of love. He hasn't changed. He continues to be a God of wrath, a God of holiness. And yes, those for whom Christ paid the debt, he bore that wrath on their behalf. But his wrath abides on all those that are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, have been and will continue to be. And so the word declares his wrath. I dare say, even as we read here, people have a notion of God's wrath in their conscience, even unbelievers even ones that perhaps don't believe this word, yet there is in their conscience that testimony of God, of which Paul speaks later, their conscience either accusing or excusing. 
they know there's a judgment to come. They just don't know how severe. And they can't believe again that God would actually send the people to hell forever. In their minds, they've got to come up with ways that eventually God's going to have mercy. Eventually, he's going to say, okay, you've suffered enough. And eventually, he's going to allow them into his presence. Well, that's not what we read in Scripture. This wrath, again, unless the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the sin debt, that wrath is forever and ever. But we also see God's wrath revealed even in providence in how God will cause his judgments to be seen and known. It could be through a flood, it could be through a storm, it could be through a war where the Lord literally wipes out great populations of people. How many see that as being God's judgment. It's all part of it. Just like we read there in Revelation chapter 14. These things that, really Revelation 14 is about what God would do there in that first century in Jerusalem. The people didn't believe it. They said, well, we have the temple. But Paul wrote about that concerning the Jews upon whom God's wrath is come to the uttermost. When Christ came and they crucified him and they said his blood be upon us and our children. It was and is. I've talked to some Jewish people and they wonder well, what's with us that it seems like we are constantly suffering. Well go back and read the scriptures. Not that they're any worse than anybody else but it's to say that God demonstrates, reveals his wrath through his providence. And there's nobody that can ever declare, well, some innocent victims died today. There are no innocent victims. We're all born sinners. We come into this world sinners, and we go out sinners. And again, unless the Lord Jesus Christ has paid our sin debt, we'll know nothing but the wrath of God. It's only in Christ that that wrath has been removed. When Christ came and shed his blood, and that's really the good news that we saw last time in contrast to the bad news that we're seeing this time. The good news, as Paul said in Romans chapter 1, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why not? Because in it is revealed the very righteousness of God from faith to faith. In other words, we see God's righteousness. He didn't just look the other way, that when Christ came and paid the sin debt, it was to satisfy God's holiness and righteousness. To propitiate means to satisfy and to turn that wrath away. That's what Christ did on behalf of his people. You say, well, why is the gospel so vital then? Well, that's where we come into verse 18. You see, verse 18, we have a twofold revelation, don't we? In Verse 17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So preaching the gospel isn't just saying, Oh, well, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, and if you'll just accept Jesus, everything will be okay. No. In the gospel, the good news, the very righteousness of God is revealed. That is how God could be just, maintain his justice, and still show mercy to sinners. Well, that's revealed in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there we have the revelation of the righteousness of God dealt with in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here now, in verse 18, this is a twofold revelation. You see, verse 18 begins with the word for. Whenever you see for, that's giving you a reason. What for? What's for, therefore? Well, this shows the importance then of the gospel because of the wrath of God. If the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel from faith to faith is not God's satisfaction for you, then what remains? Nothing but his wrath. That's the only two options. Either Christ paid your debt or he didn't. 
And if he didn't, then there remains nothing but the wrath of God abiding. So here, first of all, in verse 18, we see the reality of God's wrath. And then secondly, in verses 18 to 23, we see the reason for God's wrath. And then in the last part of the portion, we see the result. So three R's. Pretty easy to remember, isn't it? The reality of God's wrath, the reason for God's wrath, and then the result. In other words, how it is then manifest. So let's look at the first one here in the first part of verse 18. The reality of God's wrath. You might walk out there today and it's a beautiful day, sunshine, blue skies, kind of nice day and you take a deep breath and think, oh, this is just such a great day. Well, all of that is temporal if you're not one for whom Christ has paid to sin debt. You can get a sense that, okay, today's a better day than yesterday, but it really isn't if you continue to be under the wrath of God. And while the world looks around and thinks the greatest peril, if I were to ask you that question, what's our greatest peril today? As a nation, as individuals, or as people? People are gonna say it's the economy, it's look how bad things are. No, the greatest peril facing the human race is the wrath of God. And they don't even perceive it. They're not even aware of it. In fact, they'd rather not hear about it. That's why there are not a lot of people sitting where the gospels preach because they don't wanna hear about a God of wrath. They don't wanna hear about a God of holiness. They don't want to hear about a God that had to be satisfied with nothing less than the death of his son. He delivered up his son to satisfy his wrath and justice. But the world doesn't want to hear about it. They'd rather go, tell me something nice, just make me feel better about myself. Well, it doesn't take away the wrath of God. And so therefore it's necessary that this be preached. When he says here, in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It's a very simple statement, isn't it? But stop and think about it. Very sobering. When it says that God's wrath is revealed from heaven, who is it against? Well, it's against sinners that have no ransom. It's against sinners that have no gospel, no hope and that have are busy pursuing perhaps their own lives and thinking that somehow they're making themselves favorable with God when they're not. When it says here the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, that shows this is God's prerogative. And by the way, wrath doesn't mean that God is somehow agitated. The word wrath means displeasure. It's his justice that is revealed against sinners. And that's of every race conceivable. Sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And if it says that his wrath is revealed, that means it's deserved. I know people will argue. They'll say, well, I don't think that this one deserves judgment or that one deserves judgment. No. We are all sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And again, but for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but for the good news revealed in the gospel, then that wrath of God abides. Stop and think about, again, the wrath of God. In our nature, and this is speaking of all of us, we object to the idea of the wrath of God because we, in essence, equate it to human anger or displeasure. And I remember growing up thinking that if I didn't have my devotions in the morning, if I hadn't said my, had my time of prayer, if I hadn't dedicated my first thoughts of the day to God, that somehow he was gonna be upset with me. And then throughout the day when things kind of went awry, I would go back and think, oh, I should have started the day with God. Then things would have gone better. That's idolatry. That's somehow thinking that what I do affects 
how he deals with me. That's not the wrath of God. Wrath, the wrath of God is everything to do with his holy character and who he is as God and his justice. And so whatever little tiddly winks that I think I'm playing by getting that thing in the hole and thinking, okay, I, I succeeded here, that doesn't affect God's wrath or not. You're either an object of his wrath or you're an object of his grace. There are vessels of wrath and then there are vessels of mercy. Now he chose a people from before the foundation of the world that he gave to his son. He did that in his love. They're objects of his mercy. And that's why Christ came. He couldn't just by decree say, okay, their sins are forgiven. His justice still had to be satisfied. And that's the message of the gospel. How God can be just and justified. And that's why Paul wrote there in Romans 1 and verse 16. Where he spoke of salvation. What is salvation? But that we've been saved from his wrath. I know we think well, we're saved from our sin. Well we're still sinners. But we're saved from the condemnation of that sin. There's therefore now, doesn't say no sin. In fact, John says, if we say we have no sin, then the truth is not in us. We lie. No, we're saved from, to be saved means to be saved from something. We're saved from the wrath of God. And that's the primary definition of salvation. And so when I ask, when was salvation accomplished? For his people. A lot of people will put it at the point where I realized one day I needed to get down onto my knees and ask God to forgive me and he saved me. So what are you doing? You're making your salvation based on something you do. But that's not going to deliver you from his wrath. In fact, if you haven't already been delivered from his wrath in the death of his son, all of those things that you do are nothing but deadly poison. To give you a false assurance. I believe when Paul said. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel means good news. So the good news. Is to be saved from the wrath of God. And I'll tell you. There's not a day that goes by. But what I don't thank the Lord. That it's not based upon me. Or what I do or what I think. That that wrath would still be upon me were it not that Christ had come and put it away. He's my propitiation. He's my sanctification. He's my justification. He's my glorification. It's all in what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross. That's where salvation is. And that message needs to be made clear and plain. To many today who think that the death of Christ was somehow a down payment. <clears throat> he came to kind of set things straight, got things started. And now it's up to us to finish it. By our believing or by our consecration, our walk, all these things. That's works religion. No better than idolatry. No, think about the wrath of God. His justice, his holiness. And that apart from the work of Christ, there would be no salvation. But in the work of Christ, that's where salvation is. And so here, in proclaiming the good news of the gospel, as we saw last time, we see, though, the absolute necessity of the salvation from God's righteous wrath. Otherwise, there's nothing but condemnation. So that's the reality of God's wrath. We could spend the entire message on that. But we move now to the second part here in Romans 1, the second part of verse 18 down to verse 23. And this is very detailed, very specific, what we read here as to the reason for God's wrath. Why is God's wrath revealed from heaven? Well, it's because all are guilty before God. And here we have the demonstration. Here's the proof. This is if, as if you were called into court 
and now the indictment is read against sinners. That's what we see here. Why do we need the work of Christ? Why do we need him as the advocate? Why do we need his blood shed? Why would nothing less than that blood shed save us from God's wrath? And again, when I say save from God's wrath, it's not just speaking from eternal condemnation. It means against his displeasure. We're born in this world as, as sinners. Even a young baby comes forth from the womb speaking lies. And that child is under the wrath of God unless Christ has paid his sin debt. But here we see the reason then for God's wrath. And it's just when we read that his wrath is revealed against, notice two words here in verse 18, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. There's never any word in scripture that just repeated for filler. When you see those two words, ungodliness, see the word God in it? That has to do with man's offenses against God. We, it's not just that this sin and that sin is an offense against God. We are an offense to God because of who we are as sinners. And so that's what ungodliness is. It's everything that stands against God and his character and who he is, his justice and holiness, and righteousness. But then it says here, and unrighteousness. And in that word unrighteousness, you have the word what is right. That's where you get the word integrity. And in this particular context, it's speaking specifically of sins of men against men, against others, unrighteous. In the Old Testament, when it said, for example, of Job, that he was an upright, he was a, a righteous man, a just man, that had to do with his dealings with other people. The Lord, by his grace, had so taught him that he paid his employees and was just toward them. He paid his whatever taxes that were required. He did those things that were just, right. It has nothing to do with righteousness before God because that's only in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe that in these two words here, in verse 18, it's talking about every aspect of who we are. In our ungodliness, that's what we are by nature, that's our offenses against God and in our unrighteousness. That's our character and how we deal with one another. And I'd have to say we'd, we'd have to plead guilty. That's really the sum of the whole law, isn't it? That the Lord said, the commandments, thou, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength. Well, that's ungodliness when we don't. And love thy neighbor as thyself. That's unrighteousness when you don't, and who does? So here then are the two reasons that are set forth right at the beginning of an indictment. If you were to get a, a legal indictment from the court, you ever seen how those lawsuits, those ju judgments are written at the top? You, you see who's, who's judging whom, and then you look for your name. Oh, I'm in there. Okay, what's the... What's the indictment? Well, it's put right here. That the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And then the rest of what we read here are the details. How it's broken down. And the first thing it says here in verse 18, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, when the indictment is read honestly, you ever had people tell you that? Well, can I be honest with you? Well, I wish you would be. Maybe I ought to say, I want to be frank or something, but the honest truth is that when men are indicted and uh, their sin pointed out, what do they do? They suppress it. Or they try to reason around it or argue against it. That's what we are by nature. Here it speaks of suppressing the truth of God. It's not, not that people don't see that God is sovereign, but they suppress that truth. They don't like it. They don't want him determined. 
It's not that they don't see themselves as sinners, but they suppress that truth. They'd rather think that somehow I can produce something that's going to get me out of it. And that's what most people think. If they're drawn, taken in front of the uh, court and the indictment is read, their first thought is, how can I get off the hook? How can I get out of this? That's suppressing the truth rather than dealing with it. And we know by nature, such as our nature, that every truth revealed to us by God and that through his word, our nature is going to be to fight against it. It's going to be to disregard it. And it's going to be to deliberately obscure it. I'll tell you, there's some preachers today that can't stand and preach through Romans 1 like I'm doing right now because of what we're about to hit here. And I know that there's some, when they hear this, they're going to think, you can't preach that in our day. Yes, especially in our day. Because this is God's indictment against people, against nations, against us as sinners. It's not that when it says here they hold the truth in unrighteousness, it doesn't mean that people don't know the difference between a truth and a lie. Because God has made us in such a way that even in our depravity, in that conscience, he has put his stamp, if you will, as to what the truth is. But the problem is, man would rather suppress it. Even here in verse 19, it's, it's as if people are already looking for excuses. And so the Lord just continues to squeeze here as we go down through verse 19. Someone might argue, well, you know, what about so-and-so out here that's never heard the gospel? Aren't they without excuse? Nope. Here it says, because that which may be known of God is manifest, there it is, in them. So there is that light of the knowledge of God that God has put in every sinner, even though depraved, and that God has showed it unto them. I remember going back in some villages and remote places there in Africa where they'd never seen a Bible, never heard of it. And I would ask the village chief, I'd say, is it okay to steal here in your village? Oh no. Is it all right to commit adultery? Go take another man? Oh no. We have strong penalties for that. Well, where'd they learn that? Well, that's that light that was in each one that's described here because that which may be known of God is manifest and therefore God has showed it unto them. What's the problem? Well, it's the rebellion of the heart to reject what is clearly revealed, to reject this wrath that God has revealed from heaven. Even the invisible things, it says there in verse 20, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What's he talking about there? It says being understood by the things that are made. If I found a watch, a Rolex lying on the beach somewhere and pick it up, that didn't just evolve. Someone made it and it got dropped there. And yet people want to act as if this world just evolved and that there's no creator. Why do they do that? Well, because they don't want to have to deal with a holy God, a just God, a sovereign God, a creator. But that doesn't change. Remember, this is an indictment. <laughs> This is the judge speaking, that he says that even from the creation of the world, these things are clearly seen. Even his eternal power and what? Godhead. That word Godhead is a reference to all that God is in his attributes and glory as Father, Son, and Spirit. So that they are what? Without excuse. But, 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 no. Without excuse. You speak up, you'll be in contempt of court before this sovereign judge. And that's really what we're seeing here. His invisible attributes are clearly seen. Clearly seen. Not seen fuzzily. Well, why people don't see it? Because they're not stopping to look. God 
reveals something of his power and his divine nature through what? Creation by the things that are made. Stop and just pause and look at a little wildflower, even a wildflower, and look how intricately it's made. Are you going to tell me that someone didn't make that? It wasn't man. So even in that, the very power of God is seen. You say, well, why don't people give him the glory? Because man wants to take the glory. That's in his general revelation. But even there, the things are clearly seen. That's obvious to any that have eyes to see. But it's there in the mind and heart of man. The problem is man would rather think otherwise. Clearly seen. See how it's put there? This revelation. So that man is without excuse. And look at here as you continue. In verse 21, because that when they knew God. I don't believe there's truly any atheist in the sense that they don't believe there is a God. They just don't want there to be a God. Atheist literally means against God. And a fool says in his heart, no to God. That's a fool. But it's not because the evidence is not clearly there, although it says they knew when they knew God, what? They glorified him not as God. That sums up the, the, entitled, the, the entire indictment here with regard to man's rebellion against God. They knew that he was God, and yet they would not glorify him as God. The problem is not that men don't know God in the sense that there is a God but though they know him they refuse to glorify him as God and that really is what comes down to the difference between what the gospel declares concerning God and what man would rather hear because the gospel gives God all the glory but man would rather have something to say something to contribute even though anything that man has to put his hand to can only bring further condemnation. You notice here, it's, it's not talking about even what men classify as the worst of sins. If man has his worst sins, he'll put number one here, number two, number three. Look at here how God's wrath is revealed and the reasons for his wrath. Number one, knowing that he is God and yet not giving him the glory. Just as simple as that. Number two, knowing he is God and not being thankful. Complaining about it. Well, we know that's our number one problem. Because we believe that God directs all things. And yet, as soon as this mouth opens, what's it doing? Well, I'm just kind of a rotten day today. I'm not sure anything's going the way I want it. What's that? Unthankfulness. And again, it comes back to how vital is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. Because if he didn't pay that sin debt, even down to our un ingratitude, our unthankfulness, that wrath of God would be upon us. And justly so. It says they became vain in their imagination. That's where it all is. It's in the mind and heart. And their foolish heart was darkened. It was already darkened and it continues to be darkened. Unless or until God by his spirit grants that knowledge of Christ in truth professing themselves to be wise here again these are reasons for God's wrath and it's not listing any major sins as we have thinking of murderers and adulterers and all these things it's talking about not acknowledging God for who he is being unthankful professing ourselves to be wise when in reality we're nothing but fools. See, that takes the work of the Spirit in the heart to confess that that's what we are by nature. Unless Christ has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four 
put it these and creeping things. That's what man will always do. God is spirit. And uh, he reveals himself through his word. But man is going to take anything with regard to God and try to turn it into some kind of idol. I don't care whether it's in the world or whether it's even in religion. You can take, man will take something even like the, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, and make an idol out of the bread, make an idol out of the wine, and uh, think that somehow that there's life in the element itself rather than in the one that the element represents. There's a lot we could say there. But that's, again, when you take what is to God's glory alone and you change it into an image made like unto corruptible man or to birds, the four-footed beasts and creeping things. The, the Romans, see, in that generation and, and also the other nations, all of their gods were represented by some sort of physical beast or whatnot. But what's the idol today in our popular religion? It's free will. It's man's will that trumps everything. You'll hear it said God would really like to save everybody, but unless you give him the permission, unless you let him, he can't save you. Well, what you've done is taken the glory of the uncorrupt of God and made it into an image like unto yourself. You thought that somehow your will is what directs God. It's not. He's sovereign, he's holy, he's just in all things. And if he ever teaches us, that's the first thing that, that dies. You die to self. You die to your own will. But the third and final part here, I want us to see in verse 24 down to verse 32 is the result. What's the result of God's wrath? We've seen the reality of it. We've seen the reasons for it. But here in verses 24 to the end of the chapter, the result this is the tragic result of what it is to be guilty before God and to be without hope, without help, and without God in this world. It says in verse 24, wherefore, see it began with four in verse 18, the wrath of God. That's in, in contrast with the gospel. Now, wherefore, why is all this so, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So that's the first result, is God giving men up to their own devices. Is he just in doing so? Absolutely. Does he have to save anybody? Only those that he's purposed to save in his will. The rest, they stand condemned and justly so. Any that find fault with God and saying, well, what right does he have to leave some to themselves, give them up and others to save? That's his right as God. Just the very fact that you question him shows the rebellion that's in your own heart. And you prove it by how you respond and react Especially here in verse 25. What, you, what, what does man normally do? Change the truth of God into a lie. And worship and serve what? The creature more than the creator. Who is blessed forever. Amen. Again we get back to this so called free will religion today. What is it doing? But changing the truth into a lie. The truth is that God saves whom he will. And the lie that is changed is saying, no, it's up to you whether God saves you or not. Well, you've just changed the truth into a lie. The truth is that everyone for whom Christ paid the debt, he saved, he justified, he redeemed when Christ shed his blood. That's the truth. What does man do? Change it into a lie. Say, well, nothing really happened when he died. Now it's up to us to appropriate it. That's a word that you like to, people like to use. You, you have to appropriate what Christ did in order for it to be effectual for you. Well, guess what? You've just taken the truth and turned it into a lie. 
And I could spend all day on this right here, just going down through, again, the indictments against us when God leaves men to their own reprobate mind. That's what they'll do. They'll change the truth into, here it says, a lie. Actually, in the Greek, it's the lie. There's no greater lie than for man to think that somehow God is waiting on him to do something. No. Salvation's of the Lord from beginning to end. And again, it's repeated, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. And, and likewise also the men leave the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in, in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. See, people would prefer even that sort of what's called lifestyle, and yet rebellion is what it is. And it's not anything new. We, we see it more openly today, men with men, women with women, and, and now even transgender and all of these things, you say, well, what's going on? That's the result of God giving sinners up to their own reprobate minds. That's where they will go. And we're seeing it, but it's not new. Sodom and Gomorrah, go all the way back. You can read under the law where God denounced things that today are being made popular and thought to be right, and yet it's nothing more than changing the truth into a lie. These ways in which people continue, they're, they're, you know, they've rejected already the truth as it is in Christ. They've rejected the word. They'll not hear it. And uh, so what God does in giving them up to their own reprobate mind, how far will they go? Every time you think you've already heard the worst, get ready. It could get a whole lot worse before God completely wipes out an entire nation. He's done it in the past, and he certainly can do it even now. In modern culture, homosexual practice, really, according to scripture, I know people try to justify it and say, well, you know, that's just the way we're born. No, according to scripture, it reflects the abandonment of giving themselves up to uncleanness in the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. That's the word. And thereby receiving the recompense of their error, which was made. People can think they're getting away with it, living that way and thinking, you know, we're free to do however we want to do. Well, guess what? You still have to answer to a holy God and a God of wrath that unless Christ has paid your sin debt, you'll stand before this God, or I'll, I would say you'll be bowed before this God and cast into utter darkness. There it says in verse 27, when it says they receive in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Don't say God's not just and condemning such to receive in themselves the very penalty, that's what the word recompense is there, of their error, which was due, that's what the word meat means, due. So Paul speaks here of this penalty for what kind of conduct, homosexual. Homosexuality has within itself a penalty because it's nature against nature. It's going against nature. You talk to some that are this way they're not happy i've talked to a bunch of them they're not they're miserable ultimately when you break it right down why because it's like going against how god has purposed that they should be it's destructive nature and we know that the lord has even in his judgments uses sin that people pursue to be the judgment that in the end it's what condemns them Sometimes it's the penalty of the disease that is the consequence of violating how God has 
establish the order. There's an order all the way from the beginning. People make jokes about, you know, Adam and Steve. No, it's Adam and Eve. It's always been that way. One man, one woman. But people are trying to redefine marriage and then repackage it as if somehow it's okay. And they call that freedom. Or in our day, being woke. Well, what it is is waking up to condemnation is what it is. And so <clears throat> we see as we go down through here, again, where does the blame lie? This is verse 28 says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's the number one indictment right there. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Is he just in doing so? Absolutely. That's how his wrath is revealed. That's what we're looking at here. The reasons for his wrath has to do with a, when it says a reprobate mind that God gives them over to, it's a debased mind. Rebellion against God is displayed in the faulty thinking, in the mind, that reprobate mind. You can look at some people and boy, they seem like the nicest people in the world. That's not the problem. The problem's in the heart and the mind. There's a heart and mind of rebellion. And it lists these in Romans 1, 29 to 30, 32. The list here, again, gives concrete examples of the kind of things which are not fitting. They're contrary to nature. They're contrary to God. Even though they might be socially acceptable to man sins. Look, look at them again. They're not ones you even think about. Covetousness? <laughs> Ooh. That's the very first thing that's, that's stated there. To do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, and covetousness. Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God. Here it is again. No man is, every man's without excuse. Knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. See, that's the issue right there. Man knows that the wrath of God is against these, and yet man cannot deliver himself. When they want to preach up free will, free will, I always say, well, how that work? how's that working for you? Just try to stop sinning right now. Just determine, I'm not going to be covetous. So when your neighbor gets a promotion or they buy some new vehicle or some other thing, you, you look at it and think, well, I don't think they deserve that. Well, what is that but covetousness? Not being thankful for such things as we have can be something as simple as that. You see why we need deliverance? Why we need the Lord? Why we need... Otherwise, <laughs> this describes who we are by nature, and that's where we bow our head and wonder. Why would God save a wretch like me? Because there's not one thing in this indictment that doesn't apply to you or me. The only difference is that it pleased God those that he gave to his son he delivered him up that he might freely give us all things in him that's the gospel that's the power of God and the salvation so if he's delivered you thank him because what we've just read here is the indictment against all those outside of Christ that will know nothing but his wrath and condemnation well, let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 210 Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. 
rejoicing because it is done a child of the father joined heir with the son saved by the blood of the crucified one save save my sins are all pardoned my guilt is all gone save save i'm saved by the blood of the crucified one saved by the blood of the crucified one the Father he spake, and his will it was done. Great price for my pardon, his own precious Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Save, save, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Save, save, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed. Look forward to the next time, Lord willing.